So hi, everyone, both virtually and in person. We are so happy to have you in our November edition of AI Plus Careers. Um, I'm David about Christian, a director of intelligence here at SESP. Uh, so there are some familiar faces in the room, but for those of you who might be new to SESP, uh, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit, tech-first special project. And our mission is to really help the US government and other relevant stakeholders best position themselves in this new techno-economic strategic competition that really defines our world today. And an important line of effort as part of that is really thinking about how AI and other battleground technologies are impacting national security. And as part of that effort, SESP's Workforce Innovation Task Force, of which I'm a very proud member of, along with Diana and my uh, colleague, Ryan Carpenter, are really focusing on the future of work aspect of this dynamic. Having an AI-ready workforce, especially within the federal government, is an important way that we stay agile and competitive. And to that end, we began our monthly series of AI Plus Careers to really tackle this issue from all the possible avenues. So for that, we're really lucky today to have with us Justin Reynolds, who's the Director of Tech Policy at the US State Department, whose illustrious career has spanned both the public and private sector. So we're really lucky to have him and talk about his journey in this space. So the way this works is we'll have a conversation for about 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the floor, both for those of you in person and online um, for open Q&A. And then please stick around after we're completed to you know, just network and eat all the rest of our snacks. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, we'll get started. And we always start with a very basic question, which is, can you tell us about your AI plus careers journey? How did you get to the nexus of tech and national security? Sure. I started my career up as a foreign service officer, and I worked on um, three of the countries that I think SESP refers to as great disruptors, so China, Russia, and Iran. Um, I wanted a chance to try to work on countries that I think have significant impact in the global system, um, and that I think it's hard for Americans who are born and raised here and have never lived in those countries to, to fully grasp the perspectives and the dynamics at play, and so I wanted a chance to learn those languages. Um, and get a chance to dive into those areas. Um, and then, I, so I worked in, in China, I worked in Iraq, um, I was at the National Security Council as a director for Russia, and my last role with the State Department was as spokesperson for Iranian affairs um, before I received an opportunity to go work at Facebook, where I worked in the CEO's office, um, helping them design teams to help reduce the likelihood that um, people would suffer violence due to content that might be spread on those platforms and trying to keep people safer online, especially vulnerable populations. Um, so that's what really brought me into uh, the AI space, because given the, just the sheer volume of content on Facebook's platforms, you must rely on, at the time we called it machine learning, uh, tools called classifiers if you're going to try to find hate speech in you know, Aromo and Heart to Grey, Somalia, the four main languages in Ethiopia, or pick your market on down there. And so trying to improve the precision uh, recall of our, our machine learning tools is what got me into the AI space. And then, of course, you came back into public service. How has your private sector experience really impacted sort of the things you're most interested in and are looking at most critically in your new role at the State Department? So I think it's it's given me a different frame, um, having spent most of my career in the, in the public sector, uh, one, an appreciation for, for road mapping and, and kind of the goal setting and, and, and ensuring that you get things done on a certain timeline that the private sector really focuses in on um, helps me build out the teams that I have at the State Department and help them focus on the impact. So that's just like a general uh, mindset shift that has occurred. And then in terms of where we focus, I think it, it's really trying to ensure that the U.S. is best positioned with our partners and allies to take advantage of these technologies, but also to, to continue to build and, and grow Places where we're leading and make sure we've got the workforce as you've alluded to, and also the supply chain all the way up for research all the way through. And just kind of looking at, you know, I think that entire long period of your career, what have you been, I guess, most struck by that has changed? And what are the trends that you're looking at most closely now? Um, I mean, in terms of things that have changed, much, <laughs> a lot has changed. I, I, I got into this space you know, pre-9-11, so the, the world has shifted two or three different times um, since then. But um, the trends that I get to focus on now that I really enjoy is, is really diving in on, on 
on where AI, uh, synthetic biology, and, and quantum are, are headed and, and how they might impact national security and, and trying to work with our partner uh, nations around the world to, to ensure that we're able to exploit those benefits fully. And I guess in the large kind of AI and national security thing, do you think of us as being in a really critical moment right now when it comes to AI and the future of geopolitics? Yeah, I mean, the, the technology and probably anyone who's, who's spending time talking and, and joining these series would, would likely agree. It's evolving so quickly that um, we need to, one, make sure it, it's being adopted in places where it's safe to do so uh, as quickly as possible, but two, we need to make sure we're protecting our research advantage and our, our ability to commercialize and, and, uh, and, and use this technology to solve real world problems as quickly as possible. So I think that's that's something I'm particularly excited about is that kind of inflection point of where you know, it goes from, right now the B2B applications are really big, but in, in terms of how useful it's going to be for consumers, I think we're, we're getting very close to an inflection point. And I guess your State Department, so where does State Department fall under all and really getting the U.S. prepared to face the challenges, specifically in this space. Sure. So we're working with uh, countries in kind of a few different categories. We're trying to, to build very close partnerships with the, the other countries that are leaders in the AI space. So, for example, next week we're going to convene the, and launch the AI Safety Institutes Network. It's a mouthful, but we're bringing in all of the countries that have AI Safety Institutes to San Francisco um, to try to actually build technically rigorous standards so that if we're going to evaluate AI models for safety, we have a technical standard to base that evaluation on. And in order to do that, we need research on all of the world's work, right? Singapore, Korea, UK, um, Kenya, and many other countries coming in for that. Um, and then we need to work with all of those countries uh, kind of across how are we doing research and how we're doing safety model testing. And I guess... Right now, when you're thinking about sort of the opportunities and the barriers, because thinking about all the AI safety frameworks are relatively recent, and yeah. you're now trying to bring right. a lot of countries together to bring that together. I think what are the what are you most excited about? Like, what do you see as the biggest opportunities, but also, I guess, the biggest hurdles? And when you're trying to think about this, not just in the very short term, like let's say the next six months, but in the long term over the next year, five to ten. Years. Yeah, I mean, I think I think AI will go a long way towards to solving a lot of our system people. And so being able to use it to address whatever the most pressing problems are in, in, in countries around the world is really important. And so you know, one of the barriers right now is, is compute access. So we have a partnership with the AI companies um, where they've agreed to contribute up to, I believe it's $100 million total um, of compute credits and, and some other, other tools. So that if you're a developer in, you know, pick a developing country, one of the biggest things you're going to run into is you can't even get access to compute. There's a waiting time. If you want to develop an AI tool that's going to solve a real problem for your community, now we can help you get that access, get it right now. If you can build something that works for your community, hopefully then we can build it and scale it together uh, with the State Department, but the tech ecosystem will say, all right, you figured out an AI use case that's going to make a real world application on one of these standard development rules. And so it's getting, getting the compute and getting the tools into the hands of people know what the real problems are in their community and trying to solve those and well, and I guess like one of the challenges that you're thinking in words with the federal government as well is also I think you've seen governments that use adoption precisely because there are you know safety risks. Yeah. And we're trying to assess like what what are our risk thresholds going to be. How do you think the you know the State Department has really approached applying and deploying these tools in house? Yeah. So we have a, a, a whole team called the Center for Analytics who is responsible for for vetting and and, and bringing in AI tools for free use across the department. And so they've, they've done this in a number of different areas. Uh, they've created something called State Chat, um, which is the first step of getting the workforce up and using, in an official environment, um, a generative uh, language model. Um, but then there's you know, a lot of other ways where machine learning can be incredibly useful in work that isn't necessarily at the specific you know, desk officer level that I think will hopefully automate and you know, a lot of work as well. And I guess yeah. this brings us to the question I think a lot of people are interested in is sort of like, yeah. what does the AI ready workforce look like within the State Department? And I know this has been like a real passion yeah. of your work. Yeah. So I guess, can you walk us through first sort of what your sense of the gap has been within the State Department workforce and then some of the efforts that you've been really pursuing to get an AI ready workforce within the State Department? Sure. I mean, so anyone who's 
spent time working in the federal government knows you spend a lot of time just even just formatting things and clearing them and doing that. So automating that um, and, and making it easier for people to focus on substance is, is, is one area that the Center for Analytics is working on. And they're also building out a whole series of training to try to make sure people are you know, using the various AI tools and, and get used to using them. Um, what I and my office have been doing as well are creating different training opportunities to really try and increase um, AI literacy. So what is AI and then helping the people across the state department understand what is machine learning, how does it fit, and then what our policy goals are and should be and how they can effectively advocate for our interests um, as the United States broadly. So we've built out a series of training courses. Um, we just recently offered uh, a week-long course at the Foreign Service Institute where we partnered with SAIS and ITI and others so that it was not just State Department people lecturing the State Department people or and the academics, but we also had from industry uh, and people from civil society as well. So that, and, and, and journalists, so that we got kind of a wide range of perspectives of where AI is, what it specifically is, and, and where it's going, and, and then our policy side obviously and how to advocate for it. Um, we've got a similar shorter course for the senior leaders um, to make sure that our leadership understands and then can really encourage uh, greater adoption throughout the workforce. Uh, and then I'm excited about our international partnerships. So we built a trilateral tech leaders program uh, with SAIS where we brought 10 mid-level people from the State Department, or from the US government, from the Japanese government, from the Korean government, all across the interagency together for a three-week training here in the United States, split between Washington and the Bay Area. And it basically was a elongated version of that week-long course that we created so that they could really dive in together um, and try and, and understand both not only AI, but also biotech and quantum, and, and get out and, and talk to real folks who are working in companies and research labs as well. Can you talk a little bit about like, how you felt that, whether it's been successful, what are the improvements you'd like to make in future iterations? Yeah, it's it's been great. I think the biggest part is how do you scale that experience? Right. It's very intense. Of even, and there's, I guess, two parts. One, I want to scale this training to get it out so that we're creating most of the workforce on, on these concepts um, so that there's not a a version of like the last thing I want to hear is say I'm not a tech person. I want I want our management officer to understand this so that when they're contracting, they've got they're, they've got a familiarity with AI systems because it will improve the energy efficiency of our buildings. I want our consular team to understand this so that you know if they can speed up our image recognition by adopting a better image recognition tool. Like it it applies across all our work streams. Um, and then the second part that I haven't I don't have a work plan for yet is how do I take the cohort that just got trained two weeks ago and keep them up to date? Because obviously, you know, if they go out to post for three years, by the time they come back, it's going to be a very different time world. And so trying to keep that relevant when everyone's already overburdened with information flow and uh, demands of work is, is something that we're going to have to try to make that piece. Things are changing. And so what is it exactly the approach to learning? Is it a lot of hands-on this is how we're going to teach you to use AI in your daily life or your professional life, or is it more theoretical? So uh, those there are the hands-on courses that the Center for Analytics runs, where they'll teach you how to use state chat, or you can they'll run you through other other applied technologies. Uh, ours is much more theoretical. Of where where is what is a frontier model today? What does it mean? What is it capable? What is it not? Um, and then. Um, and they get into, into the other technology areas we focus on. So it's it's much more theoretical. It's not that it's not a good blind side. And is it is this a course that someone opts into, or is yeah. it something that you're trying to eventually make more as part of the performance evals or mandated yeah. in some way? We're not at, at the moment it's opt into. Uh, I, the demand has been more than we've had a extensive waiting list for each of the two offerings we've had so far. So I think for now we're we're focused on that. I, I do think as I get more staff on my team, I would like to start building you know, that AI component of training into you know, political officer tradecraft or uh, PD officer tradecraft, the different kind of courses that everyone in, in a given special to take, but that's that's on a, a second half of next year. For that. And I guess in the other part of this, not just the upskilling of the current workforce, but the recruitment of the talent as well. And have you started to see more have trained recruits coming into the State Department? And if not, how could that be better marketed? Or how could, where do you think the State Department could improve in trying to recruit that talent? 
So, I mean, I think that there's several barriers to to that recruitment. One of which is it takes a very long time for someone to onboard to federal government. It's the same from from your experience as well. Like, and so you know, even people who come in with valid clearances from other agencies, it still can be a four to six month. Pipeline. And, and most people that have relevant skills generally aren't waiting around that long because if you, you know, go to one of these big tech companies within the first year, you're, you're good, you're getting promoted. Why would you wait one whole promotion cycle just to finally get started in an engineer's job? Um, so trying to shorten that window. Um, the department has done a few things that are helping bring in additional tech talent, uh, both to the civil and the foreign service. Um, one is the department now has direct hire authority which allows it to review all the resumes of people who are applying in which means they can, you know, if you have a, someone who comes from a tech background and they submit a one page resume, they might not be past the USA jobs screener. <laughs> um, now the hiring manager has access to review all those resumes. And so if they see someone with a tech background that's particularly interesting, they now have the ability to interview them. And then on the back end, they can do, you know, make sure that they hit the qualifications for GS14 or 13 or whatever it is, but it, it allows the hiring manager some discretion candidates they also speak with. Uh, we also created a mid-level entry program into the foreign service. So the system has historically been you came in as an entry level no matter how experienced you were. So when I first entered the foreign service, I had people with me who had you know retired as older colonels in the military, you know, long careers. Now they were coming in as you know the lowest uh, on the on the possible scale and having to start going back up. And, and similarly, if I want to recruit you know, an L7 from Amazon or, or Facebook, it's a hard sell to say you're going to come in as you know, an FS5 or a GS11 you know, equivalent. Um, so now there's a way for a small number of people to come in at the mid-levels every year, including a specific um, cutout for people with tech experience. So we just started that last year, and that will let us bring people in at the O2 level uh, that have that tech experience. So it's not going to be an earth changing thing, but it does let us start infusing them a little bit more talent, a little bit more higher up in the, in the pyramid. Actually, this is an interesting question. I'm like taking a step back. I think I was a political scientist mm -hmm. trained. Um, so the through line for me to the intelligence community, as I did, was very clear. You know why yeah. a political scientist would end up in the US? Yeah. Similarly, why someone with a background similar would end up in the State Department? Someone mm -hmm. who is tech trained. Like yep. what does a career in the State Department actually look like? What are the options that are available? Because I sometimes feel that that's part of the challenge, you know, right. seeing what a job in federal service could look like if you don't have that conventional background. Yeah. So I think it's I think it's important to remember most people, like if they start out as software engineers, their goal is to end up to be, you know, then you go up to a product manager. And once you're a product manager, you're, you're, you're a very well-paid, desk officer or a project manager, <laughs> you're managing people, you're not writing lines of code yourself. And so those are a lot of the people I want to, to try to recruit are, you know, they know how to manage projects, people, deadlines, bureaucracy, because people on Facebook are bigger than the State Department, um, even though they like to move fast, like I have to remind people, <laughs> like if you can navigate Facebook, you can navigate the State Department, it's not any bigger. Um, and and so it's it's bringing those type of folks in. And then really, just like you can plug in a foreign service officer kind of anywhere, I think you know a product manager could add extreme value virtually anywhere across the department. Now, if you're looking for a specific tech role, um, we are hiring data scientists now, and then they get deployed, you know, basically as a data scientist all throughout the department to try to help various uses of data across various offices uh, portfolio. So there's kind of a couple of different ways of going about it, depending on what your tech background is and what you want to do. And what, and in terms of the from the mid-career professionals you were thinking about, where have they largely landed? So they that's for the foreign service. So then they go in and they get you know a bid list and get an overseas job, you know, working on, you know, in an environment science and technology section or an econ section. Um, or even in a public diplomacy section where they want to learn how to get messages out to whatever public in the country they're being served in, but their tech background will serve them well, both in terms of translating our tech diplomacy messages, but also uh, in terms of using all that technology to you know, write the foreign press summary in Kazakh. AI is really great for that. <laughs> it saves a lot of time. Um, or putting out 
the videos and podcasts and everything else to try to yeah. And I guess so we've talked a lot about individuals coming into the state department, but the other important thing are like just general partnerships. So yeah. The thing about emerging technology is really the fact that there's a lot of development. In fact, most of it is happening in the commercial sector. So you have to think about it as where the relationships the State Department needs to have domestically and abroad. So we've talked a little bit about the countries. Can you speak a little bit about kind of the State Department's approach to having these relationships with companies or others like SSP that is operating in the space in order to stay ahead? Sure. Uh, I think I mentioned the partnership, I forget what PGI is, all this evidence, but the, you know, using AI to solve sustainable development goals working with the largest AI companies uh, in the US. Um, I think trying to come up with nimble partnerships is, is really important. And we're hearing that from our international partners as well. So uh, when I was in Peru a couple of months ago, the request of the Peruvian government was they really wanted to just meet with someone from OpenAI. And so uh, the chamber was able to arrange for uh, OpenAI and Amazon and IBM and a few other country companies to, to all come for an event that we helped to pay for where we brought together uh, legislators from across South America, as well as civil society, academics, and industry to share perspectives on, on AI and how it could apply in the Peruvian and broader South America. Okay. Yeah, but, uh, anyone who follows Justin on LinkedIn knows he travels quite a bit. I, I think in some of your recent travels, what if in places that maybe we're not looking at as carefully for AI, like AI development, what has been like the most exciting thing that you have been seeing and what maybe we should be thinking about back home? I think I mean I think the fact that it can turbocharge your ability to develop an app or a service or a business. With very little capital. If you have someone who can figure out how to use these tools, and I, now that the tools are capable of doing the programming for you, you don't have to have a large number of software engineers to build the base version. Um, so if you can figure out how to use them to automate or find a real solution to a problem, that's exciting. Like, I don't, you know, when I was in Peru, I was saying, you know, not every country in South America needs to try to build their own frontier model. That would be like the cost and the energy, like, it would be enormous. But if you can, if we can help facilitate the access to the compute to to your your developers, then then hopefully they can build something. Do you think there are any places that we're not tracking as carefully that great development is happening? So South America is an example, but are there are there others that we should be looking at more closely? Sure, there are. My office, being small, is still in the process yeah. of figuring out that and trying to engage a broader set of countries. Um, still got a lot of work to do, and that's. And I think um, switching gears because this is SESP, and as you mentioned, we're very focused now on thinking about the access of drift servers uh, China, Iran, Russia, North Korea. And as you mentioned, that you worked three of those four portfolios. Um, I would just love to hear your perspective on sort of what you are looking at now when it comes to the best way to position ourselves to win this competition in relation to those disruptors. Um, and in particular, like how did that, like, what you're looking at in the last policy. I think, I mean, we need to learn the lessons from the 5G yeah. experience where, you know, unlike in 5G, in AI, America has the best companies. So that gives us one pillar of, of strength. But I think it's it's also, we can't just go around the world and tell countries you shouldn't do X, whatever that is. We have to have an affirmative vision for our own. And so, in that case of going to Peru or Nigeria or, or other places and saying, all right, here's what American companies are doing and here's how they're going to help support your goals and then trying to figure out ways to work together uh, and get the access uh, to the technology out to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, with local context so that's usable for people who don't speak, you know, one of the top 20 languages in the world. Um, and, and so I think having that affirmative vision is, is really important. Because if we just come in with our export controls and our, and our protect side of the agenda, um, it's a lot harder to move people. But if we can get the benefits side as well and then say, and here's the small area of like where we're serious about protect, what is vital to our national security, and, and explain why and how, and how we're still going to help them achieve their goals if we are going to make it available. Small areas of, of big ships or, or other technology that we choose to protect or, or, or limit. How do you think that messaging is going so far? Or where do we might need to tweak that approach? Um, I think, you know, we're, 
I think we just need to do more faster in more places. I think that's the you know the technology is this isn't this isn't nuclear technology and centrifuges like it's not a non-proliferation regime. You know, AI software and technology is to use much more quickly. And so, uh, how do we how do we make sure that we've got our affirmative vision uh, in as many places as possible so that people are looking and seeing the benefits of you know not only working with AI companies but then understanding as they build out and replace the rest other parts of their tech stack, the value of uh, building on a secure and trusted supplier base as they build up the whole thing. Uh, and I think we've got a, a lot of work to do on that next. And of course, as you mentioned, your office not only covers AI, but also synthetic biology and quantum computing, which is also a big part of the way we're thinking about competition. Um, I think for those who may not know, can you explain a little bit about kind of what exactly is your looking for when it comes to synthetic biology and quantum computing and in relation especially to, say, China? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think it, they're a little different. In, they're, they're very different. Um, so in, in synthetic biology, we want to make sure that we have supply chains so that we're not dependent on any one country, whether that's China or any other part of the ecosystem. Um, but right now, a large number of pharmaceutical and precursor chemicals are, are sole sourced from one country. And so trying to build in uh, resiliency in that supply chain is, is really important to us because if the supply chain is disrupted for whatever reason, um, we still need to be able to manufacture pharmaceuticals. Um, <laughs> um, and then on, on quantum, I think quantum is much more an emerging technology rather than like current day critical technology. And so um, it's it's building out an ecosystem with our partners to make sure that whichever, there's many different possible pathways to a quantum computer, none of them are guaranteed to work. Um, and so anyone who tells you, you know, they've got the proof that this path is going to lead to a quantum computer that's, you know, God's going to demonstrate supremacy over a classical computer. Like they're they're obviously looking for funding um, because I don't think any of the scientists are, are at that point to, to confidently say that their pathway will actually be the one that will lead to quantum supremacy. Uh, obviously, companies and countries are making big bets on several different pathways, but you know our our goal is to make sure that all of the very precise components that are necessary for each of the different pathways. Um, and we have a, a supply chain that's resilient and, and secure so that you don't run out of dilution refrigerators if something happens to, to the supply in that in that space so that we can work you know, the very precise optical mirrors and so on. So um, and then and then it also requires a lot of discussion with our partners on you know, workforce skilling because you know, some of these things require you know one technician who is polishing one particular type of surface, and if he's out sick or on parental leave or it's a she, like whatever it is, like if that person disappears, all of a sudden we have a supply chain backlog. <laughs> and so, how do we how do we build out the, the workforce for this? You know, what has been a very often niche you know, machine tooling or, or machine uh, creation system, and, and make sure that we've got redundancies and we've got a shared market so that they know if they produce extra whatever it is. Uh, Someone's going to pick up that often. And these are just three critical yeah. technologies. Um, where do you sort of these other technologies that need to be brought in or folded into your portfolio? Because yeah. I ask this is because SDSP is constantly looking at sort of the main technology in China, whether it's robotics, networks, and manufacturing. So part of the challenge I know is always getting yeah. ahead, three steps ahead. But if you had to make some <laughs> bets, where do you put your money? I wouldn't, I, I honestly wouldn't gamble because I know my predictive powers are not great. Um, <laughs> so I, I mean, I think it's, I very much looks to, to groups like SCSP and, and others that are, that are not, you know, I feel like we're, my team is, it's small and it's sprinting. And so when we will look, you know, as you're building out your fusion summit and as others are building out you know, robotics work and so on, we'll, we'll be triangulating, looking for that feedback of, okay, at what point does it make sense for something to come in and does, and whether or not it comes into my office or if it's you know states ENR Energy and Natural Resources Bureau that should be spending more money and people and time on it. Uh, that's something that I I would be able to.
Um, before opening the floor to our audience here, I do want to ask one last question, which is obviously a lot of people here are really motivated to be thinking about careers in this space and are considering public service. So what is your advice for um, our audience here, both early career professionals and mid-career professionals, about why they might want to pick public service? I mean, I, I think it's it's the desire to serve. Um, you know, I, 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 the reason I came back was I wanted to help do my, you know, tiny part in, in ensuring that the United States and our, our like-minded partners have a chance to have an edge in, in these technologies that I think will play a critical role in determining our future, both in terms of our economic prosperity, but also potentially our national security. Um, and that's something that's that's you can you can do from from the outside. And this is like SCSP. Um, it's harder from industry, um, and, and I think you know. But I think you know there's there's real value in, in coming in. I think one of the things we talk about is pipelines and talent pipelines. And what I really am trying to, <laughs> to see if I can help the state and other parts of the government move into is much more of a an in and out system, uh, two way system. Because I do think there's also value. You come in, you work really hard in public service for a few years, um, trying to drive a mission, but then taking time out to refresh and, and look ahead and figure out and sharpen your arguments while you're not also in the implementing phase or like on the phone negotiating with you know, our Singapore or Korean counterparts on our mission statement for what the AI Safety Institute is. By negotiating that, it doesn't, I, I'm not looking ahead to what the user or bodies are. I guess actually ask my last last question, which is, do you feel like the federal government in your time of having been there, gone out, come back in, is more open for a variety of experiences like needing to go to private sector and coming back? Because I think some of the challenges that people want to think of some sort of big career. Yeah. And now we're seeing that point is a rich tapestry. Sure. So do you see that you know people could come back in feel like that's valued experience? Yeah, I, I'm definitely seeing a few people who have you know, come back in um, and others who are looking to take time out for whatever reason, uh, expressing an interest in you know, potentially returning at some future point. And I think part of that also becomes more feasible as remote work agreements become more prevalent so that it's possible to do, you know, you're not working in a classified space, like go work at somewhere in Seattle or whatever, and then stay in Seattle while you know, doing a couple of years as a civil servant and, and, and that sort of thing, but also helps you kind of want. You know, um, I'm going to open it up to questions, both virtually and in person, though I will assert moderator privilege when um, I feel like I, there's a good opportunity. So please. I'm happy to, to start with a question, just to open it up. Um, thank you so much for your thoughtful remarks and for joining us today. You spoke on one hand about recruiting technologists into the State Department and the range of opportunities there. You've also spoken a lot here and elsewhere about how technology policy is really reshaping diplomacy um, and how you uh, interact uh, with strategic partners and allies and even not strategic partners and allies. Can you talk a little bit about the compliments here? What what does this evolution in diplomacy mean for the future foreign service officer? What kinds of skills do you think will drive recruitment going forward for the foreign service? What can you say about the evolving roles and responsibilities of what it means to be a foreign service officer? Sure. I mean, I think historically, the environment science and technology sections and embassies were not a place that led to the quickest promotion. Um, but now, you know, in, in many cases, technology is moving very up, up the agenda and, and alongside you know, traditional more harbor national security issues. So I think that's one reason why it's attracting a lot more people who are interested in it because its, it's importance has, has risen rather rapidly. Um, all right, what was the second part of your It was about how you see the evolving uh, skills demand for foreign okay. service officers and what that future role might look like. Sure. I mean, I think it's it's needing a, a fluency with, you, you can't advocate successfully for U.S. interests on, on, in, a, on a, in a policy level if you want to be influencing policymakers, <clears throat> whether domestically or abroad, um, if you don't understand the underlying technology. And so building that level of literacy and then fluency is, is, is important. And I think 
we're, we're going to see that come in at the entry level just naturally as like now the number of people who you know, master's in emerging technology at SICE and at CSA and, and other places like that didn't exist when I joined the Foreign Service. There were no emerging tech master's degrees. You could do like management science and engineering or something if you wanted to. That was the closest I could, I could find, you know, when I wanted to look at tech and, and national security when I was around. Um, so, but, but how do you, but that's not necessarily fast enough. And so how do we infuse people at the, the mid and senior levels, especially on the civil service side? And I think that requires you know, convincing hiring managers to look at their positions a little bit differently and, and prioritize people with those skills, which is happening because I think they see some of that as a, as a need as they try to build out their team. Um, I think the positions, yeah, I think it's just going to be a part of most, many people's positions. Needing to have that fluency in order to do their job well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Really, really enjoyed your course. Thank you for so much moderating. My name is John Baba. I serve as strategic AI advisor to the chief officer at CISA. As already you said, uh, yeah, it's software that is that Lisa? Happy. That is Lisa. Yeah, good. Just raised over from Boston. Um, so I just uh, would consider myself a real professional. Um, in your distinguished career, I would hope to sort of also stay within uh, public service and uh, work in different pockets of the interagency, work on issues like AI and emerging technology. Uh, I had a more careers focused question for you. Um, shared how I started off as a foreign service officer uh, and some really cool things at state. White House, then left for the private sector, and then have come back. Uh, my question to you is, what tips do you have for early or even mid-career professionals, um, the sort of roles and responsibilities or portfolios of work to take on to maximize their impact, the, the impact that I could have, for example, in a public sector role versus a private sector role? Are there things to prioritize or uh, you know, give a little bit more weight to if you have that flexibility? flexibility or freedom um, to craft that sort of a role. Uh, and any thoughts you would have there? I mean, so I think the first part of like how to have the most impact, I think is spending as much time as you can with your work focused on impact. So, you know, a lot of government I can just be consumed with meetings that have very little impact or it's clearing documents and doing like change happy to glad editing. And, <laughs> and so just cutting as much of that and figuring out, all right, what in the next year is this? So like, what do I want to say I was a part of? Sure. Um, and then, I mean, the, the earth for the very early career folks, it's, you know, it's running towards all of the hard work that no one wants to do. So like when somebody, when I gave this talk 15 or 10 years ago and they asked me how I got the job in Moscow, I said it was because I was doing the people publish. So when I was in Baghdad, like I was the ambassador staff assistant. I was basically triaging his email and making sure, you know, knew which meeting requests came in and which to take and where to go and you know, it's a lot of admin stuff, but I had his binder prepared every morning at never very early hour um, and made sure it was up to date and it needed switched during the day so he had what he needed when he needed it and just basically stayed out of the way. Um, and then that let him trust me enough to then bring me into a whole series of much more uh, consequential things, but it was, you know, that was the kind of entry of am I competent in those basic tasks? And then if I was, then that let me do all the, the, the cool stuff that I really enjoyed, like getting to listen in on the then vice president's phone calls with Iraqi leaders to take notes for him. So I made sure, so he made sure he had a accurate uh, line of conversation. And that's, it's those sorts of experiences that then give you the confidence to be able to do. I mean, you're in a great spot. They said, absolutely. She's mm -hmm. amazing. Oh. And then I think the other part is like pivot quickly towards hard problems. So I came in knowing I wanted to either learn Chinese, Russian, or Arabic. You can't do anything big in the international system without at least accounting for China and Russia. Then Arabic, we just invaded Iraq and I would be what a trillion dollars in Arabic could not do in terms of, of nation building. Um, and so I think, you know, I. I didn't follow the traditional foreign service path of pick one region and kind of stay with it. I wanted to pick those three up quickly. Um, and then 
you know, I went to Facebook, was there two and a half years. And when I was clear, I was ending the point where I was going to continue to have growing impact at high speed. I quickly pivoted and I got an opportunity to move over to the startup Robinhood, a fintech company. Um, and so I think it's just, I've been in a place where I've uh, been afraid to jump uh, when I saw something that seemed compelling, but I, everyone's got their own was tolerance. Hi, my name is Sharif. Um, I work in the private sector in AI and biosecurity. Um, I have kind of a more philosophical question for you. So I attended a talk last week with um, Jacinda Arden um, from a private sector in New Zealand, and she was talking about how in the wake of Christchurch, the difficulty she had in getting contacts with some of these tech companies, right? And she, had to, she said she had to have Emmanuel Macron call in essentially on her behalf. And something I've been thinking a lot about is that these tech companies more and more are wielding immense levels of power, capital, influence on this course and see what truth is. And granting that the US government is in a very lucky position that the most powerful government in the world and we have these in our backyard more or less, how does the State Department think about its role interlocking between these, especially American companies, and maybe these much smaller countries, the heads of state, uh, obviously a lot of concerns over how technologies impact them. Um, I mean, I think there's kind of a, a twofold answer. One was you know, one of my roles that, that Facebook was building out public policy teams. So when I got to Facebook, the entire Middle East, with the public policy team was five people. Um, and so building it out so that there's more people covering uh, a very important region so that you're not just trying to rely on one or two contacts um, is, is part of it for the big companies, but obviously the, the smaller ones aren't going to be able to build out the same teams as, as your alphabets or your metas or, or so on. But, uh, you know, one of the things I encourage our folks at the embassies around the world to do is, you know, who is, like, make sure they know who is the LATAM public policy manager for OpenAI. Like, two years ago, the public policy team for OpenAI was two people. <laughs> um, now they have someone for LATAM, they've got an Asia Pacific lead, they've got an India lead, and so on. And so, okay, whatever it is, you know, there should be people at each embassy that know who they are and how to reach them. Um, and then if the government is, isn't sure how to facilitate those contacts, like the embassy should actually play that role. Uh, but the, I mean, countries around the world have also grown a lot since you know, 2018 um, in terms of their relationships with as well. And so they've, I, most, I would assume the public policy need for each region or country for the main ones would be very well known to, you know, to the leadership. And I thought this was one question. How do we think about the way that they wield the tech companies wield their influence power in contrast to maybe the government agencies where there is a level of democratic accountability. Um, obviously, they're driven by markets and different, like profit motives, very, a different, a very different incentive structure than public servants are. Mm -hmm. um, and so, how do you, as a public servant currently, obviously across the boundaries, navigate that conversation or the, the thoughts around their civic responsibilities? Except that you do, I guess. So, at the moment, I mean, there's there's litigation going on that limits what the executive branch contact is with the tech companies in relation to content moderation, and so that is not something that I I do in my in my job is have any sort of contact in that in that way. Um, nor would it in my my particular office would play that. Role. There's there's others that theory could potentially have a, something to do in that space, but. Um, you know, I think, I think that's a question of how do you build out content moderation or product, uh, content policy or product policy, um, where a business's goal is often to have, you know, ideally a global standard, because it's much easier to enforce one standard than many, um, with the fact that there are different legal regimes and cultural and social norms globally. And which ones do they want to adhere to, and, and how are they going to do so? Um, it's it's a very very tough problem, and I think it's you know in the financial sector, you know, banks are very used to dealing with okay, 
I've got to comply with the EU's laws, US law, Brazil law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there, is, there aren't the same compliance structures in place where things are legal or illegal in the same way when you're you know, talking about transferring money, but you're talking about various forms of speech. And so it's, it's a lot more, yeah, as you say, a philosophical question that has you know, real world impact. So much, my name is Paul Poulter. I'm now a, a team consultant for different LLMs. Super curious about how uh, the digital solidarity strategy fits the works in practice, especially with these AI safety institutes. Mm -hmm. we, you know, in your vision, what does solidarity look like? Ability, is it shared standards? Uh, and then where does that AI strategy fit into that? Yeah, I think that's that's part of what next week is is about trying to figure out. It's like what you know, can we come up with an idea of a standard that could be mutually recognized or shared? If so, that could potentially be a good path towards a little bit of less of, of splintering of, of standards and, and um, I think but I think yeah, it's it's so I mean in digital solidarity, I know. Part of it also is, you know, make, trying to make sure that countries know that you don't have to build the whole next stack yourself. In fact, you know, we found in the case of Ukraine and other places, it's very valuable to have things that can easily be moved through the cloud to, to other other servers located elsewhere. So I think that's that's part of it as well as some of our strategic competitors try to push the narrative that you know you need to build your own data centers locally because that's the only best way forward. And I think the solidarity can stay. There's, there's other ways of securing your data that might make you more vulnerable. Let me jump in with a question. Kind of thinking about next week, um, obviously there's a lot of different avenues to explore it. There's a lot of potential debate that we have. But if you had to outline sort of like the main priorities and what you would consider a win in terms of if we all agree on the following things, that would be great. And also is to um, what would that be? So this is very much the, the first convening. Yeah. And so I, I don't, I don't think we're looking for, you know, there's certain, it's not a, we very purposefully not brought in ministers and, and others. So it's not looking for deliverables. We're not looking for speeches or a sheer set of, of talking points, but rather it's it's bringing in the, the technical experts. So you're not going to see the public policy needs from my old employers or others there. It's going to be their, their AI technical experts, red teaming folks, that type of people. Um, and so it's really coming up with an actual work plan that then the three working groups can carry forward, hopefully, uh, so that it's, you know, bringing them together towards building some of those ideally shared standards. Always happy to jump in with a uh, oh, Go ahead, Diana. No, so, uh, just to uh, kind of pull on some of these threads, really great discussion. I'm always focused on the, the workforce element. And what is your experience when you're working with other strategic partners in their ability to have the conversations that you need to have and, and where do you think some investments could be in terms of partnerships to help grow and cultivate people with the, the right skills or the right expertise? And it's been very good. We work with a lot of different ministries in, in our country. It's just like, you know, they, they were partnering with the Department of Commerce on, on the AI Safety Institute network launch. Um, so, you know, if we're in Singapore, it might be IFDA or Said in, in another country, um, in order to get the right people in the room. So it's it's very often an interagency experience on not only the US side, but the other country, which adds complication. Um, most of our, our our video calls feel a little bit like Hollywood Squares, where you've got you know, 16 people because you need three or four agencies from each country that's involved. Um, but everybody's really excited to move forward. And so we're seeing investments being made in you know, our partners for ministries, building out their own emerging tech teams um, or you know, building out abilities to do international cooperation in, in some other ministries of science and information technology. So 
it's fun. Like it's part of why I came back. Um, but, it, but we are seeing you know real investment in this, you know, from the partners in Kenya and Nigeria to some of Korea, India, et cetera. And, and so it's just how do we keep that going? So I have a question, which is um, obviously it's kind of put on a thread of been asking earlier is, is the profile of the Ford Service Office really going to change as we're thinking about these technologies changing? But another question is as we're talked a lot about techno-economic strategic competition, which in a lot of ways is a changing change from national the traditional scope of national security as we, as we think about it. And obviously that changes what the role of diplomacy is. When you're thinking about traditional national security, you think a lot about war fighting. But now when you're thinking about techno-economic competition, you're not just thinking about the battlefield, you're thinking about all the other ways in which um, you know, states engage. How has diplomacy changed given the fact that technology has evolved and really changed the world? And I think it's it's the type of economic diplomacy or economic statecraft that has, has always been a component. Um, I think it's just now it, it, it really does transcend because the potential dual use of much of this technology, it, it has incredible application in the economic sphere to drive economic growth, um, it has human rights implications um, based on how it can be used, and it also has potential military uses. And so um, technology kind of fuses into all of the different parts of the diploma diplomatic toolkit, and that's part of why I think the training needs to, and the, and the workforce development needs to hit across the, the base of, of the national security state, whether it's you know, all of the agencies, so that they're able to understand both the, the opportunities and the risks advantage of or mitigate. And has this also changed the way you engage your, your counterparts within the US as well, whether it's AC, DOD, Congress? Yeah. I mean, it feels very different, but I mean, when I was last in government, you know, there was no pound tech net sec at the White House. Now there's a whole directorate focused on technology and national security, but there are also, you know, technical people working on this in International economics at NSC and kind of all the different directorates have people who can understand and you know as emerging tech that apply to whatever their issue set or country set is. Um, and so it's it's similar, it's similar to to how functional bureaus have worked in the past, and that they've got to be able to work across the regionals and with the other functionals. But I think it's it's different in that it's not just economics to craft or military. It, it kind of, it's going to have an impact and, and how it will impact those and at what speeds is still on that. So that's why I was kind of rushing to get ready. Right. Um, so I'm from the Midwest, just back here this past summer. Um, and I can tell you that a lot of the conversations that we have here in DC, and probably for good reason, the people back in my hometown either have no idea what's coming or have these are not anywhere, not even at the top of the list of concerns, but nowhere on, on that list, right? And I, I think the point you made about remote work is so crucial to kind of recruiting from some of those places. But more generally, how do you relate the work that you're doing in kind of a diplomacy conversation and the rapid advancement of this technology and the coming impacts that maybe are, are seen in some of these rooms or at least talked about but are not talked about at the kitchen table? How do you bring that back? Um, so, I mean, it, it kind of depends on, on which audience I might be talking to. Like I grew up on a farm in Iowa and so like the applications are, are really real, whether it's, you know, through better genetics for your hogs or automated systems that allow you to do precision planting with you know, much less paying attention while driving the tractor, um, at least compared to what I was, I was doing with our, 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 our machinery. Um, but I think. You know, I think it's you know some of these some of these issues are are issues for the national security side, uh, but then if it's but then yeah the the broader impact of how AI is going to disrupt work is is something that I know Commerce is and, and the Department of Labor are thinking thinking about very seriously because you know if we have self driving cars, what does that do to the drivers of both passenger vehicles and and uh, consumer goods, they, that would be very disruptive. Uh, but that's, that's a whole lot of, of additional work that needs to be done. 
Uh, a question for you. State play is such an underappreciated role in your political competition, especially as it relates to technology. They own the projector, the quote, uh, the three P's protect, uh, promote, and then project, like projecting value to product. Talked about a couple of different tools that fall under that category. One is standards, and uh, you know, maybe the conversation next week is a step towards um, national standards. Export controls, which were a big part of this administration, working with critical allies and partners across the supply chain to drive towards interoperable uh, restri restrictions on chip controls, for example. Those are the two big uh, sort of tool sets that like jump out to me under that project category. Are there other sort of underappreciated or under-discussed tools that as stakes of the next four years, for example, uh, that you're thinking about that um, state could lean into, certain parts of the State Department could lean into as it relates to AI and You know, I'm, um, I think all of them, that's the right answer here. Um, Short answer is is yes, but I think it, it it a lot of it is just closer engagement with our with our partners um, abroad, trying to both work on the promote side, but not but to do it kind of across the full stack of, of our capabilities. Um, and then on on the values side, you know, it's demonstrating you know how we want these systems to work domestically and and trying to. To show why that would also be uh, in the other countries. When you say better, like in your references earlier, uh, building off the blessings for example, like 5G, what are some, like to the extent that you're able to share, what are some of those lessons for uh, both in working with allies and partners um, to do things better or unique challenges that are associated with AI, for example? I mean, I think with AI, it depends. If you're trying to build the app, or if you're, you know, if you're trying to actually build a, a workforce that can then build train your own model, um, the costs are very high. If you want to be at the, at the frontier space, and so it's it's discussing with other countries, you know, what is going to serve their needs best, what are their actual desires, what are their goals, and and how might they best achieve those, and, and is it by making a, a substantial investment in in hardware, software, and talent. Or, or are there other avenues that might best serve it? And so it's it's having those kind of kinds of conversations, because um, I think each country is going to forge kind of their own their own pathway with AI. Um, but certainly under the, the current system, where the, the best models are consuming vast quantities, of um, not going to be something that I think every country is going to want to or going to investments to build. Can I just ask one yeah, more, just one more, just pulling this all together. Uh, thinking about the next year to three years, what will success look like for your office? And what advice um, in this rapidly changing world uh, would you give to someone who's excited about the mission and would like to lend their technical skills or expertise to the work that you're doing or to the State Department? I mean, I would, I would say, come come join us. We're, we have two jobs advertised right now that are open on USA Jobs. Um, we'll have three more that will be opening very soon. For uh, one is a bio, will be for a bio uh, expert and two quantum experts. Um, so we are recruiting and hiring. Um, and you know, I think it's it's really trying to build the, the international partnerships so that we make sure that. America stays firmly ahead in places we're ahead where we, we close any gaps that we might have and that we build out uh, uh, an ecosystem of suppliers and talent uh, so that we can, we can fully harness the benefits of these, these technologies. Well, please join me in thanking Justin for joining us. Um, and please join us on December 4th for our next AI Plus Careers. We're going to be featuring an amazing panel from ODI, the IC. So we're really excited to have that. And please stay behind um, for refreshments and to talk to Justin some more. Thank you.